Thanks for playing. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? It's a beautiful day outside. You know why? This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I put my weapon of choice over this. There we go. Well, do you realize by the time we get done with Lent that the average temperature for Cedar Rapids, Iowa is 63 degrees? Mm. So look what we get fo to look forward to here. Yeah. Think about Easter. Yes. Of course, in the end, we've had snow on Easter. Iowa's weather is fickle, so, you know, yeah. we'll go for the warm weather. Mm -hmm. But anyway, good morning. Welcome to Gray Street Church. If you're watching online, hey, please say good morning so we know that you're with us here this morning. And so we welcome you to be with us today. Uh, we have started our Lenten season, and we had Ash Wednesday on Wednesday night. And... Uh, uh, we are a small but mighty crowd that came through, and, and uh, it was a very good time. And as we go through our Lenten studies in here, we are going through seven words, listening to Christ from the cross, and this is by Susan Robb. And uh, uh, while most of us naturally want to avoid the reality of the cross, because, you know, it's kind of a tough thing to do when we think about it, the cross is not a, a great thing for a lot of people. It's how we betrayed Christ. But also, on the other hand, it also speaks to us. Jesus spoke to us from the cross. And it speaks to us about the great love that God has for us. And so as we explore this series of the seven words, we understand, we come into a more full understanding of God's love through the cross. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword that way, but the study brings a... Uh, contemplative view and, and a hopeful view uh, take on the cross. So it gives us a little bit different view of what went on there and, and how we should view it. So this Wednesday, the 21st, our study continues at 7 p.m. So we'd love to have you all here. And then as we progress through all the fun stuff we have going on here at Gray Street, March, and the men of Gray Street then, on March 2nd, instead of having our men's breakfast and everything here, we're going to the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference down in Davenport. And that is a way to e equip men to, to be in a closer relationship with God. And they have breakout seminars and everything. Uh, lunch, it, you, you never saw anything until you saw uh, 1,500 bags of Chick-fil-A <laughs> set out in a lunchroom in there and tables. It's all, it was just a sea of bags of Chick-fil-A. It was really, really cool. So uh, it's a very, very good time. It gives you a good opportunity then to reconnect with God and reconnect with a lot of men. So this, this picture you see here, I'll have to bring in one of my pictures that I took because we were in the nosebleed section up there last year. Um, but all you see is you see wall-to-wall -wall men and we're singing songs. And... The, the sound of that, I could imagine what it's going to sound like in heaven when we get there. It was awesome. It's, a, it's an awesome time. So if you have the opportunity, um, we're going down there. We'll probably be leaving here early uh, to go down there because it's an hour and a half trek to get down there. Uh, but then following up on April 6th, then at 9 a.m., we will continue with our men's breakfast coming up. And then we have season 19 of of Orange Track Racing hits the track Saturday, March 9th, uh, and that is at uh, 9 o'clock for registration, 10 o'clock racing starts. So if you have some some kids anywhere from 3 to 87 years old that who want to come and race, they're more than happy to race, and it's it's dirt cheap entertainment, and it's a fun way to connect, and it's, it's great to watch the kids. We had several new people come this last week and come in, new racers that came in, and uh, one of them says, well, I only, have a, you know, I only have a few cars here. And I said, by the time you leave, you're gonna have lots more, so just trust me, because uh, they always get free cars. And they get guys that, that have been around forever, have all these tickets where they've won races and everything, so they're handing them out free car tickets, free car tickets. We have price tables in the back back there. They go through, pick out whatever cars they want, so. Orange Track Racing again on March 9th. And guess what's just around the corner? Well, it's time to have Gray Street Cinema again on the 16th. 
at 6 o'clock p.m. We're going to be showing Finding Normal, and it's a story of uh, Dr. Lisa Leland, a renowned physician. She's on her way across the country, and she and her boyfriend are going to set up a new practice out east and uh, until she has a little problem in normal North Carolina. And uh, so uh, she gets pulled over and, well, one thing leads to another and the judge sentences her for community service. And so she's gotta be the small town doctor because the doctor's out. And uh, it's a life-changing event, but uh, normal might be just what she needed in her life at that point. So we have a lot of fun things coming up, good things on the way here at Grace Street. And uh, for today's worship, for those of you online, um, it's gonna be posted up online and Diane will be posting the link here shortly for that. And uh, so we thank everyone for being here today. Let's go to God in prayer as we begin our time of worship this morning. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, uh, we just praise you and thank you for the beautiful sunshine that you give us today. Um, the sunshine in your son Jesus and the sunshine in the weather outside today. Between the two of those, it's got to be a fantastic day in your presence. So Lord, we just lift you up in honor, glory, and praise today. Fill our hearts with your word. Fill our hearts with your word and music today so that we will be prepared to go out into the world and be your shining light for others today, Lord, and each and every day. So, Lord, I ask today that you would open our ears to hear the message and our hearts to receive that message and that we would live it out each and every day. I ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he comes to give us the message that you put on his heart today. And, Lord, we, th we thank you and praise you for the words that uh, you have given us in this study, this Lenten study. And today we're going to be talking about today you will be with me in paradise. And what a promise that was. And what a promise it is for us as well. So Lord God, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here freely and openly as the family of God, your church, here at Grace Street. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So our call to worship this morning that Pastor Terry uh, has chosen for us comes from Genesis 2. 8 and 9, and this comes from the New Living Translation. Then the Lord God planted a garden of Eden in the east, and there he placed man that he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So in here, we can see that God had love for us from the very beginning. He created us, but he created a, word, a world in which we could flourish and that we could live. And so we see a glimpse right here of God's love from the very beginning. God's people that he created are distinguished from all the rest of God's animals in the kingdom in that they are made in his image. Human beings are created to be like God. They are created to be like God. Now, given that we are not to think of ourselves as a God, so don't get that confused, but we are created to be like God. But we are created to be likened to the image of God. And that's what that means, to be created to the image of God, in the image of God. So we are to be like God, which means we are to be a godly people and to follow God's direction to be a godly people. Our behavior should mimic that of our Father in heaven in his son Jesus Christ. So God sent Jesus to give us a living example of how to be godly people, how to be like God, how to be the image of God here on earth as we live out our lives. As believers and in regards to the resurrection as we're going through our Lenten studies in here, it, it came to me as I was going through here, and thank you, uh, but truly that tree of life that he placed in the garden well, that alludes to the availability of eternal life for that couple who were in the Garden of Eden. But moreover, moreover, from the beginning, God's purpose for humans was life, not death. See, when he created the Garden of Eden, there was no death. There was no sickness. There was no pain. Boy, I would like to be there for a while. <laughs> Wouldn't 
<laughs> Wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. He created humans with the freedom to sin and choose death, and yet also to believe and to not sin and have eternal life from the very beginning. They chose poorly. They chose poorly. But then he also sent us the ability to believe in his son Jesus and have that assured eternal life through our belief in him. Free will, free choice, our choice. And we see these choices carried all the way to the cross. All the way to the cross. So as we hear Pastor Terry's message this morning, we hear that promise that today you will be with me in paradise. That speaks to us of that promise, that assurance that Jesus was giving, not only to the criminal, but to us as well. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the promises, for the assurances, for your word. Lord, we can't know all of your promises unless we study your word, unless we read your word on a regular basis. See, you've set it all out before us. So you've given us everything that we would ever need to have eternal life with you. And you've written it down. But we have to read. We have to take our part. We have to do our part. We have to invite you into our lives. So we invite you today, right now, right here, to come into our lives. To be the guardian of our lives. To be the guide through your Holy Spirit to guide us into your presence and into eternal life. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you that you are such a good God. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think Mark was like, Genesis 2? <laughs> It was due to the take that God presented me with. I watched, because uh, this is a, a video-driven study that we're doing on Wednesday nights, and I've watched Susan's presentation for this Wednesday night a handful of times, and read the scriptures that are in the, in the guide for this, and specifically this one, and all of a sudden it just this whole different perspective came. So I wanted to share that with everyone today. But today you will be with me in paradise. We all have our own vision of what paradise is. Might be no snow. Might be 70 degree weather. Might be palm trees and sand. Yes. <laughs> but it might be something completely different. And in a world where Things are just coming at us left and right. We were talking about uh, how uh, our uh, Iowa girl, Caitlin, had beat the scoring record for NCAA women this past week and how the people have come out and are against her and all these different things. And it just reminds me of how quickly uh, messages come and go. I mean, it's, it, that was like the shot heard round the world. I mean, it's covered by every sports outlet, every news outlet, not just here in Iowa, but nationally. And I got to thinking, and I was talking to somebody earlier this week, and we were talking about our first computers, and he had a Commodore 64, and well, I had a Radio Shack Tandy Model 3. And most of the people don't hear this term very often, but it had 64 kilobytes of memory, of RAM memory to it. That's like one little piece of sand in today's world. I mean, these things, this thing does way more than that thing ever did. This has got a color screen and a processor that just does laps around it. That had pixeled screens, so everything was a little box. How much more can we do now? I remember Dad would take, he, we had access to not the internet, because that, that wasn't available. It was a bulletin board. So you took your phone off landline for, if you don't know what that is, Google it. Took the receiver up off, and it was a, a rotary phone in the, in the den. And 
he would put it on a coupler. And that's how you got the tones to go through the, the uh, lines there. Now, anymore, we can just, uh, in fact, I was showing Mark a shortcut to how to silence his phone. <laughs> it took one button. It used to be, uh, this is like this, and I learned all the shortcut keys, and I still use a lot of those shortcut keys, because it's quicker than mousing around. But all we have to do is tap a button, or even just speak it. Last night, we were having a little bit of fun with we got one of those little Google Nest minis in our living room. We were having fun asking how old different actors were as we were watching a show, after we watched a show. And then, of course, we got cute and asked good old Google how, uh, how old I was or how old I am was. And she was like, I don't know that. <laughs> I'm like, good. But at that point in time, as we're as technology is really coming into, into uh, our homes. We had this, uh, how it would make work easier. And there was all this talk about the paperless desk. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I have paper everywhere. And relationships would get closer because you could get you know, faster togetherness, right? And now we even have video calling, you know, we can see each other. Apple, it's FaceTiming, Google Meets, uh, teams, all sorts of different things to come together. There was a hope that this technology would bring us into some sort of paradise of sorts with work where it wouldn't be so hard. Well, I couldn't be further from the truth. In today's technology filled world, it's so easy to feel isolated and alone. Because of technology, I work from home in my basement office alone. I see no one. I see a wall. So you feel isolated, you feel alone. And this same technology that is created to keep us closer to one another is seemingly pulling us apart. Some even feel forgotten. Not just by their work or other things, but by their friends and their family. For many, it's a living hell. And it can extend even further than that. It can extend to the point where many think that they are not good enough to win someone's heart or to get that promotion or the list goes on and on. The world cannot and will not fill that void. Satan is going to try, he will tempt, he will make things look good, but in reality it's just all smoke and mirrors. And Jesus went through all of it just like we have. The only difference, he didn't sin. And then he stretched out his arms on a cross and died for our sins. And that can bring an even greater worry. If he died for my sins, even though I believe in him, what am I going to do? Because I can't seem to stop doing some of the sins that I do. But is he going to stop loving me because of it? Is he going to stop caring about me because of it? Will God get to the point where he's not going to forgive me anymore? Well, scripture does take care of that. But these are the things that Satan uses to get inside our heads and try to lead us away from Jesus. Something Jesus went to the cross for us and died for us. And there is no possible way that God will turn away from us <clears throat> after he went to those kind of lengths for us to be with him. The death that Jesus would go through would not only be degrading, but extremely brutal. We are talking about this on the way in today. Passion of the Christ is probably the best depiction in any movie about Christ's death that has been filmed to date. We don't know what the future holds, but I'm not sure what's coming out of The Chosen here in the next season or two, but to date, that is the most graphic visual that we have. This is a death that was reserved for slaves and, and the most heinous of criminals. 
and one of the most inhumane ways to carry out a death sentence ever conceived. Jesus was innocent of any wrongdoing and was completely sinless. So I'm going to set the stage for today's passage. And while I'm doing that, go ahead and grab the Bibles because I know we got them all around you. And turn to Luke chapter 23. And I apologize, I didn't look ahead of time to know what page that is on the Bible Center out there. But we're going to be starting up here in just a moment in verse 32, so when you get there. But to set the stage for this, Judas has betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus has been arrested, he's been tried, and he has been convicted. 787, thank you. Thank you. And he has been beaten nearly to death. Now, as they started out to where he was going to be crucified, the soldiers would pull Simon the Cyrene in and force him to carry the cross out to the place called the Skull or Golgotha. Along the way, people are following and lined up almost so different from a week prior when they were all lined up along the road waving palm branches and putting branches and, and their cloaks down on the ground as Jesus rode in on the donkey as the king. Now they're yelling, crucify him! Mocking him, degrading him. And in addition to all those people were that small group of Jesus' followers who still believed that he was the Messiah and their hope. And you've got to imagine in their minds, not truly understanding all that was going on, that they are in pain. They are so worried because Jesus is going to die. What will happen to them next? <coughs> here's the thing. Even in his state, barely able to walk, probably having trouble breathing after being beaten the way he was, what did he do? In the verses prior to what we're going to be going through today, he turns to his followers and he <coughs> comforts them. Not concerned about himself, but about us. He turns and he comforts them, and that is a comfort that carries on to this day. So let's look at this passage, and we're going to break this up into different pieces, so um, we'll just follow along. So if we're starting at verse 32, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And about the sixth time I read through this this week, all I heard in my mind was, sons of thunder. I was reminded of James and John. Because what did they ask? And what did their mother ask for them? to be placed in places of honor on his right and his left. And this is how Jesus replied to them in Mark 10, 38. He said, but Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering? I must be baptized with it. And as he's asking them these questions, which they both will agree that they are able, they have no idea that he's talking about the day that he would be crucified. They had asked for places of honors, but instead, on his right and left, were two criminals. One on his right, and one on his left. Jesus did tell James and John that anyone who wanted to be close to him must be prepared to suffer and die. The only way to the kingdom is through the cross. And to take this next passage even further, 
when we're done with service today, you finish worshiping with us through music online, go out, go to our webpage, click on messages, and listen to Mark's message from last week. Because this, it was Father, forgive them. That's this next scripture. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, and the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Unheard of. Can you imagine? We have a hard time forgiving somebody who cuts us off in traffic. Jesus is saying, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Even, and, and if you look at Jewish history, because you won't, these guys aren't mentioned in the, in the scriptures, but if you look in Jewish histories, the Maccabean martyrs, when they were being put down and killed, they declared to their killers, do not think that you will go unpunished for having tried to fight against God. But Jesus came to save the world. The message that Mark gave us last week was a summary of Jesus' entire mission and purpose here on earth to bring us forgiveness. And not just for us as Christians, but to everyone. Now granted, there's some steps that have to be taken to get that gift, which is to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But what Jesus did on the cross was nothing different from how he lived his entire life, how he spent his entire ministry. He asked for forgiveness of his enemies, and he wanted them to repent and to return to him. And what does one of the soldiers say after Jesus' death? Surely, he was the Son of God. If they had been paying attention, and I'm talking about his followers, he was that they were paying attention to the last three years of his ministry, none of this would have been a surprise. But we all know as we read things, as we read passages in the Bible, they change to where we're at in our walk. We are able to get more and more food out of it. You read a novel, just some fiction, you read it, and you're done. There's nothing new to get out of it. There's nothing more. You read history, it's just the facts, man. A little drag that for you, older folks. Just the facts. But that's all it is. But this is a living word of God. The living, breathing word of God. It says something to us each time we read it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, and this is from Matthew uh, 43 and 44, You have heard the law say that love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say love your name, enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love them. Pray for them. And as Mark said, you have to bless them. But I forgave him. Isn't that enough? No, bless them. You have to go further. That's forgiveness. And this is how we become a reflection of our Father in Heaven. Paul writes about looking into a mirror, and it's click. When we look into a mirror here on earth, it's like you see this cloudy version. Because <coughs> we're not perfect. It's not until we go and spend eternity with God that that becomes clear. Let's look at starting at verse 35. It says, The crowd watched and the leader scoffed. He said to others, they said, Let him save himself if he really is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And then the soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him these words. This is the king of the Jews. They didn't understand that Jesus had to stay on the cross. There wasn't a choice. He had to. It was the only way that through him that God could bring us salvation. The lead religious leaders, they were probably having a little party. They thought they had won. They thought that this would be the end of it. We're going to put this Jesus thing to rest, and we're done. He's gone. We're done. Let's move on. And then they could get back to their lives and live like they had before. They had no idea 
understand that the longer that Jesus hung on that cross, the closer and closer he was to victory. And as Jesus hung on that cross nearing a victory that most could not and still do not understand, they continued to jeer and mock him. Today we see this in our sporting events. Talked a little bit about that earlier. Worse yet, when someone is being bullied, people can be cruel. And this was coming from those who think that they are better than the other people. My team's better than yours. I'm better than that person. They're just, they're just a geek. And I'm trying to remember the term that I, they used on. We like watching NCIS, and they, I forget what they called McGee this past week in the, the new season. But it, it was a, it was, you know, for a normal person, it was kind of derogatory, because you know, it's basically calling him a, a nerd, kind of like king of the nerds type of thing, because he was heading up the cyber division for a short time. But that's people do. They they insult others, they put down others to try and raise themselves up and make themselves feel better. And it doesn't get them anywhere. Even one of the criminals on the cross who himself was being crucified got in on this. He could probably barely breathe because of the crucifixion, but he got in on it as well. This is what it says in verse 39. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffs, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. The other criminal, he recognized Jesus for who he was. So verse 40, it says, but the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Realized that Jesus was innocent of any wrongdoing. And although the scripture does not say, and we've talked about this over the past couple of weeks, this man almost certainly either knew or knew of Jesus at the very least. Because of this, he had come to a very different conclusion than the other criminal had. The other one had not come to grips with his sinfulness, with what he had done wrong, with the reason that he was on the cross. And obviously the way he talked to Jesus, he had no fear of God. This is the way that the world is. It doesn't fear God. Therefore, it does what it wants. People who don't know God are just going to do what they want. They think there's no right or wrong. That means I can do what I want. Without repentance and turning to God, the world will ultimately be separated from God for eternity. Now, you all think of hours a long time Eternity never ends. All that first criminal had, plain and simple, was a worldview. He wanted to be delivered from his immediate circumstance. He basically wanted to get up the genie or the lamp and rub the lamp and have the genie come out and have him do whatever he asked. That's not the way it works. He had no foresight of what was coming after that. What happens after I die? A lot of people think you become worm food. You just get put in a box and put in the ground. Or if you're cremated, maybe a nice vase and, and then put maybe put into a, like a mausoleum. But he had no foresight of what was going to happen next. He didn't realize what was coming. And you know, he might even have been on his high horse thinking, I don't deserve this. My crime wasn't that bad. And in today's society, in some of the states today, he may have walked free. 
No bail. Yeah, you can go. The world today has come to expect things to happen instantly, and that's what he wanted. People struggle to look forward to what the future holds. When I moved out of my mom and dad's house, I had a way of life that I was accustomed to. I had determined that I could have all the same things that I had prior to moving out. I failed to see past that moment. I failed to understand the value of a dollar. <laughs> Although a dollar got you a lot more back then than it does now, but. I thought I could do all of it. But because I couldn't see past that moment, I got into a little, a little it's kind of like a fish story. It was this big. You know, I got a little, little financial buy. I learned very quickly that I could not sustain the lifestyle that I had become accustomed to. And I had to make some changes and make them fast. Cancel the cable. Spend a few bucks and buy an antenna. All is good in the world. As I look back, I wish I had paid more attention to what my parents were trying to teach me. Others in that same position may have expected someone to come and bail them out. That's what that first criminal wanted Jesus to do. If he was who he said he was, bail me out. Save yourself and save us while you're at it. But like so many others then and today, all they wanted was Jesus to prove himself. He said, prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Well, Satan had already taken a run at Jesus. And this was at the beginning of his ministry, so we're at the end of, the, of his life here on earth. Satan, three years earlier, taken a run at him. Right after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit led him to the wilderness where Satan tempted him for 40 days. Jesus also fasted the whole time. We have a hard enough time getting from one meal to the next. Can you imagine? And then going through all of that, and then being tempted being pulled down. He got to a point where he was weak physically and mentally. And Satan would tempt him three times. Each time tempting him to go against the word of God. And each time Jesus would use the very word of God to basically put Satan in his place. The second criminal, because of his knowledge of Jesus, understood that they weren't getting out of that situation that they were in. He also realized that there was something beyond that situation. It was in this realization that he rebuked the other criminal. And then with a repentant heart, he turned to Jesus saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. <clears throat> now, is it possible that this second criminal said some things he may have regretted in his life, even on the cross? The scriptures don't tell us that he mocked Jesus, just the, the first criminal. But it's possible that he got caught, how easy is it to get caught up in something and somebody else is get, doing, right? How many other people, and we'll talk probably a little more about this on Palm Sunday, but a lot of the people that were lining the road may have just been along because of the crowd, not realizing exactly what was happening. But then he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And that was enough for that switch to go on and remind him of who Jesus was. It was enough for him to place his faith in Christ and to ask to be remembered. Ask. The crowd that had been mocking Jesus was telling him what to do. 
If you are the Christ, take yourself off that cross. Call on God to save you. Telling him what to do. What they want. The second criminal, he just put his faith in Jesus and asked. And Jesus replies, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, when we put our faith in Christ alone, then we receive his salvation. And just like those two criminals, we all make mistakes. I'm certainly not perfect. We recently had a, we got our team switched around at work and I was getting a little bit more uh, praise from my peers than I cared to. And it's like, yeah, can y'all just knock me off that pedestal now so I don't fall off of it later? I don't like being put on that pedestal because there's a dangerous thing that can happen. And that's what the, the world does. Yeah, we've already posited that that second criminal likely knew or knew of Jesus. I have to wonder if as a child he went to synagogue with his parents. He could have personally heard one of Jesus' teachings or someone may have told him about it because Jesus was all the talk. It's even likely that at some point either John or one of the disciples baptized him. Scripture doesn't tell us. But based on the way he's acting, I have to believe that there's a good possibility that he was. Just like any of us, only God knows our heart. When Jesus told him, today you will be with me in paradise, that tells me Jesus knew, God knew his heart. He knew it was pure and he knew he was asking from a right place. And that's why he got the response he did. Now, I truly believe that he lived a life that he wished he could change. And if he were to live, if some, by some miracle he were to come down off that cross alive, he would live a very different life. But in that moment, he did exactly what he needed to do to be reconciled with God. When his physical body could no longer survive and he died, Jesus fulfilled his promise to that criminal. On that very day, he entered paradise, entering into God's presence. And this is where Genesis 2 popped into my head. I was thinking back to the very beginning. In the garden, Adam and Eve were in God's presence. Genesis 2, let me just reread this real quick. It says, Then the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the beginning of the book. We're kind of in the middle with Jesus' death. Now let's fast forward all the way to the end. And we're going, I mean, chapter 22, Revelation, verses 1 and 5. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. Leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face. And his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night there. No need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Genesis, God made all sorts of trees grow from the ground. They produced delicious fruit. Revelation, on each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit. And then it talks about 
they will reign forever and ever. So they will live forever. That's no coincidence. This is Jesus woven from it, the beginning to the end. We often dream of places where we'd like to go in our life, the things that we'd like to do. Yet not one of those things or places can hold a candle to the paradise that is to come. For those who don't believe in him, they thought that was it for Jesus. But he wasn't done yet. Not by a long shot. He was just getting started. This gospel story is for everyone. Just like the two criminals who had a choice, so do we. The second criminal chose to cry out to Jesus. More good news. Because it doesn't matter how messed up our lives are doesn't matter what we've done, what we said. We're all worthy of God's love. We're all worthy of being with Jesus in paradise. And I think about this a little more now than I probably did 20 years ago, because I'm on the other side of the the pendulum has swung from the young side to getting closer to the end of my time here. But we don't know how long our days are. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. That's why it's only too late after you've taken your final breath. So where do you want to start? For me, I hear Jesus saying, today you will be with me in paradise. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus to take away our sins. Thank you that when we accept your son, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, that we, by your grace, your mercy, your love, and your forgiveness, we are made righteous in your sight. That is a gift that should never be left unopened and never returned. Father, let us open this gift. Let us have life through your gift. And through your gift, Father, I know that I will be in paradise. I pray that others choose that same gift so that we can all be together with you in paradise. Help me to share this gift by offering it to others. Help me to live each and every single day with the knowledge that you have not and will never forget us. Father, I want to be your humble servant all the days of my life, and I pray that for all my friends and family, whether they know you or not, Father, I pray that they would come into a relationship with you and that we could be your humble servant together. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Pastor Terry, as we come into this time of communion this morning, I want you to think of the words that Jesus was giving Nicodemus as they were meeting in secret. And he told Nicodemus that no one can enter into the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again of water and the spirit. And so here we have these criminals that are being crucified, one on his left and one on his right. And a lot of times, I, I posted this up online a few months ago, and I had some detractors immediately jump on it, the Pharisees, I call them. They jumped on it and said, well, that criminal that was, that was on the cross, he didn't get baptized. And I said, how do you know? See, here's the thing. He called Jesus by name. He called him by name. That meant he knew him. 
Number two, he says, when you enter into your kingdom, remember me. So he knew who he was. He believed who Jesus was. See, that takes a relationship. That takes knowledge. He wasn't just somebody being hung on the cross. He needed to know Jesus. And because he knew Jesus, because he called out upon him, because he believed who he was and said, to, Jesus told him that today you will be with me in paradise. He invited him to come into his kingdom. There's a lot more to this story than most people care to think about. They just buzz through the lines and read them without realizing it. But see, that speaks to me because each, each one of us is going to come to our own cross. And it comes down to, do you know Jesus? Or do you not know Jesus? Do you believe in who he is? Because if you don't, you're not getting into the kingdom. So we need to be like that criminal that was crucified. We need to know Jesus. We have to believe that he is the Son of God and that he is the way to eternal life. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's what Jesus called him home. See, we've got that assurance. That's what I talked about to start with. We have that assurance that Jesus has made the way on the cross for us so that he will step up and say, their sins are forgiven. The other one, when he comes to the judgment seat, go away, sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one you served while back on earth. So as we come into our time of, of communion today, we're called to remember that sacrifice. We're called to remember and pay homage to who Jesus was and what he did for us on the cross. And it's not an exclusive club. He did this for the whole world, for everyone. And on the night that he was given up, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Which he's doing, he's inviting them to be a part of him. In doing so, they were taking a part in his suffering and in his death. Likewise, later on in the meal, he took a cup and he blessed it. And after he blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And in doing so, we are taking part in the washing clean of our sins. So as we think about our communion time, as we're taking the elements of the bread and the juice today, I ask that you would remember that sacrifice. Remember, we need to know Jesus. But moreover, we need to believe he is the Son of God. We need to believe that he has gone ahead and prepared a place for us when we believe in him body of Christ broken for you. Take me. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. time for prayers for the people. So if anybody would like prayer, I'll add you to my list. So, all right. Well, Father God, we come into your house to praise you this morning, to give all honor and glory to you as we lift the people up in prayer and thanking you for all your mighty works that you alone have done and are going to do in our lives. 
While we wait in hope for answers and healing, we remember your word from Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we lift up Amanda and Kelly to you today. We ask you, Father, to sustain them in their ongoing trials. We ask for loving and knowledgeable caregivers to help them from one step of their kidney affliction to the next. We ask for help and healing in everyday trials. Be with them and comfort them as only you can. Father, we lift up Bill and Vicki as Bill faces multiple surgeries on his leg and they both are fighting other health issues as well. Father, we ask that you let the Holy Spirit guide them through the valley they are going through at this time in their lives. Give them healing, hope, and compassion in each new day. Father, we pray for Becky's kids, Jennifer and Alan, and their addictions. Father, you know their hearts. Lead them every day. Guide them. Help them with their addictions, Lord God. Help them to say no to the world and yes to you. In Jesus we name, we pray that for them. Father, we ask you to bring our children and grandchildren into a right relationship with you, and we thank you for the the blessings, Lord Jesus. Sustain and give hope to our homeless. Guide them through each new day. And we praise you for the job that you have given to Nick. Thank you, Father God. Father, we lift up Mark and Joe and myself for healing for Mark and Joe's knee and leg and my neck and shoulder. You alone give the power of healing to all you choose. So I humbly ask this day for your blood to wash over us and cleanse us from all attacks of the evil one on our bodies. Let us breathe in your holy power as you provide the means for our bodies to be repaired and bring new life into our limbs. We give all glory and honor to you this day for this blessing that you will provide. And we thank you, Jesus. As we pray and petition for all to be healed, let us always remember that your word is healing to our minds and our hearts. Help us to not lose hope, for healing takes time. For some, a short time, for others, a long time. But you alone, Jesus, hold the power for all things. As it says in Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So for those that are here and online today, know that God loves you, and he alone will sustain you and free you from any power the evil one has thrown at you in your life. But we need to repent and read his word in faith believing that God is our healer in all things. I say it again, God is our healer. We thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross and shedding your blood for all mankind to save us from all kinds of evil in this world. The word gives hope for each new day. And though we walk through the fire, we know Jesus is walking with us. Thank you, Father God, for your love for each and every one of us. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. I was on my way here Wednesday, and I was listening to the radio, and a song popped on I had never heard before from an artist that I'm very familiar with, his name is Rhett Walker. And it's a first song, it's a little bit slower song, so that's why I started with it, but it, the message, and Mark's smiling, I think he has to know exactly which one that is. I love that song. The name is Man on the Middle Cross. And as I was driving it, I could just Feel the spirit flowing through me. It was an amazing feeling. And it's just like God saying, Here you go. Why, thank you. And they said, Oh, by the way, here's another song for you. A little bit different version than maybe what you're used to. But it's it's a hymn. 
kind of like, this is in the vein of, say, like something that uh, Todd Agnew or Chris Tomlin did with Amazing Grace, or with the old rugged cross. But it's the old rugged cross, I Am Free, by a group called Bridge City, which is part of Maranatha. And certainly we're going to listen to De uh, Sing Death Was Arrested. And as you were praying, I thought of the next song, Living Hope. And I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't just stop at four. So, and I didn't go to six, so it's just, it was like, uh, it's We the Kingdom, Holy Water, to round us out and take us to the end of, the, of that time. But in that first song, I love this, this path where it says, I've been the one on the left, full of guilt and regret. Long gone on the wrong side of living. We've all been there. But Jesus takes that away. Father, I thank you that while we have been on the wrong side, you've given us the opportunity to make a change in our lives. You've given us things that we need when we need them. Your time, not ours. Jesus told us, ask and you will be given. But too often we demand and then get mad. Father, let us be repentant like that second criminal. Let us come to you before you with a humble heart. Father, each and every day, whether the day has been good or bad or indifferent, I pray that we bring honor and glory to you, that we celebrate our relationship with you. Because as I've found, Father, when I do that, it doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what I walked through. Because I have you. Father, continue to make it our prayer that we would go out and show others who you are, reminding them of how awesome the hope that we have in you is. And that just like that criminal who asked Jesus to remember him, that when our time comes and we take that last breath, that we are with you in paradise. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you watching online, thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to have you show up next week in person and join us here. But we're just so thrilled that you can join us online. If you didn't get the link for the music, give us a shout out and we can send it to you individually through messenger or text because we want you to hear that music and to really worship God through it. We'll see you next week.